Hello, we're back. I'm back. You're back. At least. <laughs> You've been here the whole time. You've been working hard been without here. me. Anthony has been behind the scenes running shows. You've been booking guests nonstop. Mm -hmm. He's been just on a roll of, of getting stuff done while I have been gallivanting all over mm -hmm. the great white north so i've been um, mostly yeah. being a full-time dad i've been there's been school closures there's been yeah. my wife had covid you're, for a week you're doing real real superhero stuff over yeah. there in the colangelo <laughs> household <laughs> but i did uh, so the homework that i've done for this episode was booking dr justin walsh a long time ago this has been on the calendar for a little while because uh as we we're talking about you you were just on a little world tour of sorts justin so how's it going tell us about where you've been recently yeah, I spent about five weeks in Spain, uh, in Granada, working with uh, a team on a terrestrial archaeology project at a site called Castulo. We're working to publish that. We did four seasons of field work from 2014 to 17, and then a couple of study seasons. And now we're hoping to get those results out. And then I went from there to Athens for the Committee on Space Research biennial meetings to talk about ISS archaeology. And then I flew back to LA, where I live, for 48 hours and then went to DC for the ISS Research and Development Conference for three days and then I flew back here to LA. So I think I finally now, I'm like a week back, I finally have a sense of where on the planet I am and approximately what time it is. But You've done laundry, like things are but looking But don't quote up. me on that. Yes, I have, clean, I have clean clothes. Yes, that's also a positive. Yeah. This is part of your research to live as ISS astronauts do, and you just threw your clothes out each time you got to a new city and just got some new ones. <laughs> no washing right, and this summer, Yeah, this summer I almost did an orbit. Uh, a couple of summers ago, I actually did do an orbit because I did uh, from here to Australia to Spain to here. But yeah, wow. yeah, the yeah. life of a jet set I, I, archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I can't complain about my just uh, quick trip up to Canada and back now. I don't, I don't know if that's uh, anywhere near what you, you had to go through. So <laughs> it was probably cooler there. Uh, yeah, it was a bit bit cooler, I'm sure. Were you, yeah. were you there during the whole big heat wave? Because it was it was rough in Spain for a bit. I, I, normally, I would say Granada is probably a great place to hang out, but oof, I don't know. Not when like tarmacs are melting. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spain is a little better at handling it than the UK, I think, and it's a lot more normal for them. But the last day of yeah. my dig in 2017 was the hottest day in the history of Spain, and it was 117 Fahrenheit, 48 Celsius. Wow. That was no okay. fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know exactly what that's like, bizarrely, because we had this weird heat dome in Canada last year. And I had to, I was moving, I had to move uh, during a day when it hit that temperature and everyone canceled on me. And so we were just like sweating buckets down my stairs. It was gross. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah and not in an area equipped to handle it. Yeah. No, not in any way. So. <laughs> Okay, well, that's uh, that's the weather report uh, yep. here on Off Nominal, so uh, we can move on to the next segment now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> did you bring any good drinks back from Canada, Jake? Usually you bring an uh, import or two, although you did have some no, problems at customs, no. I think, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, so because um, I've been in the process of moving to Mexico for the last year, it feels like. So um, we had a whole bunch of stuff, you know, in suitcases from our old house that we we're bringing down and customs decided they wanted to, to tax it all. So that was really fun. But uh, I didn't have space for any drinks. So I, okay. uh, I had to get one down here. But I've got um, this one called uh, Montaña today, which is from, was that going to go in? Come on, focus. There Here's. we go. Cerveza Artesanal Bosque de la Montaña from Morelos. So it's a blonde ale. I wanted something just a little light today. You know, beer company? It's pretty toasty around here. Uh, I, yeah, it is the beer it's company. It's from the beer company. Right nice. There. Yeah. <laughs> Your favorite beer I store I love the Mexico, beer company, so. man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Justin, so, you've yeah, got something nice and early out there. What are you, yeah, what are you working I, with there? I, I am on vacation. So even though it's one and one o'clock in the afternoon, I'm having a gin and tonic in honor of the podcast. Also right here. I made some wow. gin and tonics last week and my last couple limes are holding on. So I'm like, I got to use those before they go bad. So <laughs> it's looking good. What kind of gin is in yours? Bombay Sapphire. Nice. I've got this stuff. You ever had this uh, gunpowder Irish gin? It's no. so good. You should try this sometime. It makes a delicious gin and tonic. Uh, I'll check it out. It's not that expensive either. So <laughs> there we are. Um, cool. I realized that in our intro, we completely buried the lead as to why Justin is here with us on the show. <laughs> We did yeah, not mention it at all. I think he mentioned it. Uh, you've been doing this ISS archaeology project. Uh, and I, I forget why or how I inter interacted with it at some point on Twitter. I discovered it a while back. And then we had Roland Miller on uh, a couple of months back. 
And at, right after we got off with him, he emailed us, hey, you should talk to this crew. And I was like, yeah, they've been on our list. So, uh, you know, this has been something I've been thinking about for a while. I've been following along. I'm really excited to dig into it. So maybe we can start with, like, what this project dig is. Into it. Oh, dig into it. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, it's, I've been derailed yeah, entirely. That, 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 that kind of... That kind of punnery is endemic to, to the field, unfortunately. So we're I imagine to... it yeah. is. Yeah, this is uh, a, this is a. It's actually it's a preview of of the. Uh, um, it's a it's a clapback for me because we we have an interview recorded, Anthony and I, that's coming out next week that we've already done, and he made a dig joke at me. So this yeah. is just payback, it's retribution. So that's yeah, your totally. that's your teaser. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to mention before you give us the intro on this project, Justin, is that uh, you have another half, which is Dr. Alice Gorman. And uh, she has the unfortunate pleasure for all phenomenal live streams of living in Australia, at which it would be like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. or something. And yeah. uh, so Jake and I have not yet developed a strategy for having Australians on the show now that we are weekly at 4 p.m. Eastern. So we're still working on that, but uh, we should mention Alice up front as well. Yeah, the inimitable Dr. Space Junk is my co-PI on this project. Yes, definitely. I think she would be great to have on the show. I think I think it would be a fantastic opportunity. She'd love to do is it. There a, you may have to do like a time a shift thing. Yeah, yeah. Is there a good story behind Dr. Space Junk? What's that all about? <laughs> oh, I think it just came from the years and years uh, that from, I mean, she really started thinking about space archaeology, it's something like 2002, 2003, and um, really worked her way into the space industry uh, in Australia through her work and really made an effort to make a lot of contacts there. And I think somehow in that in that milieu, somebody started calling her that and it stuck. And I think she's thrilled with it. It's a, and it's even, of course, it's the title of her book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe. So um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's great. And I think she loves cool. it. <laughs> <laughs> I need someone to give me a good nickname like that. I'm like, I don't have one of those cool badges of honor that I can just target around. Listeners, she now has job an asteroid. She now has an asteroid named after her too. So she's, she's doing pretty well in that. that department. Oh man. Okay. All right. <laughs> Goals. I remember yeah. when we had John and the McDowell on the show, and I asked why his Twitter handle was a bunch of weird numbers, and he was like, "That's my asteroid," and I was like, "Oh, cool, yeah, totally." <laughs> <laughs> I get it. What else? <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> anyway, oh Justin, what the hell are you doing up there on the ISS from down here on Earth? Yeah, that is kind of the issue. We actually are not up there on ISS, but um, yeah. So this this project started in 2015. It it was really. Um, kind of, kind of inspired by the fact that I was, you know, I'm a little too online, a little too on Twitter, and I was following NASA at the time, and they announced their uh, their uh, latest call for new astronaut candidates. It was like early November of 2015, and they published their guidelines for people who wanted to apply. And, and among the things that said in those guidelines was, you know, if you have a degree in engineering or or science, you you're you qualify to, to apply, even if you only have a bachelor's degree. Um, but then there were a whole series of fields they listed that they said were, you know, kind of adjacent to or related to science or engineering that were non-qualifying. And among those were the social sciences. And then in parentheses, it actually said geography, comma, anthropology, comma, archaeology, close parenthesis. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, was, it was kind of amazing because it's like, what are we even on their radar enough? Yeah, like why did somebody think to write that down? <laughs> Has this come up before? I kind of didn't think so. But but then at the same time, it was also like, this is sort of ridiculous because, uh, you know, the fact is that, that there never has been any real social science research uh, on on long duration space flight. I mean, there, there's been like one small study that was done by an anthropologist, Jack Stuster, where he had astronauts do journals on ISS. That was really informative and really important, but that's about all there had been at that time. Uh, and it really seemed important if you were planning to send people to a lunar base or to uh, Mars, and it's going to take three years round trip, to understand the social and cultural aspects of life in space. And so that seemed like a real research gap. And it also seemed like there was a bias in the space agency. And I don't want to just call NASA out on this. Actually, there is no space agency that has ever allowed uh, non-scientists, non 
engineer types to apply until right now the current JAXA recruitment is open to mm. any educational background. Right. But we still don't know whether they're actually going to choose anybody who doesn't come from a science or engineering background. So um, <clears throat> there's never been a social scientist astronaut. There's there's such a paucity of research in the area, and it's really critical, as we've started to show with the results that we've been having with this project. So I was thinking, like, what, what would you study if you could study it? How can I show them what they're missing out on? And so ISS seemed like the clear choice. Um, you know, to date, something like 42% of all the people who have ever been to space have been visitors to ISS, 255 or more people. Don't know what the exact number is right at this moment. But, uh, but a huge number of people from a wide variety of countries and space agencies. It's multi-gender, it's multi-ethnic, multilingual. There's a lot going on there. And also ISS was created entirely to help us understand what the impact of long duration spaceflight is on humans. So, so I was thinking like, okay, I, I want to study this site, but, but how can I do that? There, there have been people like me and like Alice who've been thinking about space archaeology for more than 20 years. Beth O'Leary, who did the first project, started in 1999 and did a project on Tranquility Base. But, you know, without being able to go to a site, that seemed really a problem because, you know, typically archaeologists are present at the sites that they study or present in the landscapes they're surveying. And we obviously can't do that because NASA just told me I can't be an astronaut on the one hand. <laughs> on, the other hand on, on the other hand, I don't have $55 million to pay somebody to let me go. So, And there are not grants. For that I, I have a feeling that price is going to go up, too, because now NASA is making all private astronaut missions have a NASA former NASA astronaut as like the captain yeah. of the mission, which is another kind of ridiculous but so you might 55 might be low especially now with inflation you're gonna have to bump that up a little bit it, yeah <laughs> yeah exactly right so so it's, it's, it's increasingly far away but but what happened at the exact same time it was kind of perfect synchronicity was that a colleague named jason de Leon, who won a macarthur genius prize for this work uh, and is now at ucla uh he uh, has a project called the undocumented migration project where he was studying the effects of US border policy on the lived experience of migrants who are crossing from Mexico into the United States. And he come up with all these incredible innovative techniques. He's an archeologist, but he was using both archeological and anthropological techniques to kind of get at, at, at some of these, these, these features of the experience. And one of the things he did, this book that he wrote, which was published at exactly the same time, it's called The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail. Highly recommend it. It's not technical at all. It's an incredible book. Um, one of the things he did was he gave disposable cameras to migrants on the Mexico side of the border and retrieved them on the U.S. side of the border so that they could take photos of things that he couldn't ob observe otherwise. And that was like light bulb clicking on for me. They've been taking photos on ISS this whole time. And not only that, but they're the habitation of ISS in 2000, November of 2000, coincided with the rise of digital photography so that there's millions more images than there ever were of any previous space habitat. Uh, and because they're born digital, they actually have metadata that say when they were made. So we could actually put them in order. So if we could get access to those images and we could catalog, for example, who's in what picture, where they're located, and what other items are in the, that, uh, that space with them, and connect them to specific moments in time, suddenly we could map out arcs of behavior, arcs of association over the entire history of ISS. And that's a, that's a major part of what we're working on. That's kind of like the core of our project. And we've, we've done pilot studies that have shown the, the, the importance of this kind of work. For example, looking at visual displays in the Russian segment or, 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 or looking at the distribution of different groups of people across the space station. We can get into that, I'm sure, later on. Yeah, there's been no That's relevant cool. recent topics of visual displays of anything in the Russian segment, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is the thing. Like, it, it, I mean, it's, it doesn't make me happy that we've had these controversies over you know, what is being shown in what parts of the space station. But the fact is, we had already started to do that research in 2017. We published two articles on it in 2020 and 2021. And here we see, in a really public way, with Oleg Artemyev, yes, exactly. Well, this is actually a different different display. There's a previous display where he was holding up the Donetsk the flags, yeah. uh, Republic flag, right? And so he was, he was really uh, demonstrating that the the Russian sentiment towards um, 
towards Ukraine or the, the break, the so-called breakaway republics of Ukraine, etc. And the fact is that those kinds of displays have been happening in the Zvezda module from the beginning of ISS, maybe not in such a provocative way. The Russians undoubtedly know what kind of reaction they're going to get when they do these kinds of things. The one you just showed was also interesting because that was actually, well, Russ Cosmos claimed it was a personal effort on the part of Artemia, <laughs> where, and it, but, but I mean, you can see what a rich cultural landscape has been created here. Yeah. So, you know, start, there's a lot going from, on in that picture. Yeah. Starting from the lower left, we have the Soviet flag and Yuri Gagarin directly above that. I know it's hard to see, but there's a black and white portrait of uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who is, is the first kind of like all facts one. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's on the wall rather than um, kind of facing out. And so he, he it's actually the 165th anniversary of his birth, I believe, in September. But he's the first person to come up with the idea of multi-stage rockets as a way of getting into orbit. He was the first person to think about what life, what life would be like in microgravity. So he's one of the three major Russian space heroes besides Yuri Gagarin and the original designer of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev, whose image we do not see in this. But there, there's actually a small black and white image that's just above and to the right of that. It's a group photo. No, I, I couldn't figure out what that, yeah, right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right there. Can't figure out what that is. Then you've got these icons, uh, including the icon of St. George, which is the one that's really visible there in front of the yellow uh, canisters. Um, St. George is um, one of the patron saints of the Russian military. And in fact, the highest decoration given by the Russian military is the Order of St. George. So that's really interesting there. Then we've got the flags of Roscosmos uh, with the red stars and the blue flag of the Bauman State Technical Institute, which is, uh, you know, the, the origin mm. of the yellow jump, jumpsuits that we also saw yeah, yeah, yeah. a few months ago. <laughs> they had to that's get this flag in here to keep the cover story going, right? Yeah, At, yeah. Well, I, I'm pretty sure that that's what it was, and they had no intention of, of, of making any pro-Ukraine statements. Do you think I mean, they the, put the them on, though, kind of, and they were like, oh, shit. Like we didn't, we forgot we packed these. <laughs> Some somebody made a mistake, but <laughs> they were unpacking the, the cargo cons- bag. They're like, go for a cargo unpacking of section three of oh five panel B, and they were like, oh shit, we forgot to tell them which ones we brought. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. No. It's. I mean, it was meant and clearly meant to send a message about about the university, and it was easily misread by everybody else but uh, but yeah so then if you go around then you've got another image of yuri gagarin you've got an orthodox cross you've got a russian flag you've got another icon on the right hand wall which is the most common icon actually to appear on is and there have been lots of icons that have been sent to iss it's called the mother of god of kazan type and then you've got a flag about Tsiolkovsky's 165th birthday right there, which it hasn't happened yet, but is coming up. And then Artemyev himself is holding an icon. And the icon he's holding, according to my colleague, Wendy Salmon at Chapman, she's an, a Russian art historian and collaborated on the research that we did in this area, um, in those articles. She's, she identified this as a, an icon of St. Catherine. And it's specifically, according to the news reports in, in, in Russia, it is an icon that was given to Artemyev by the Metropolitan, who's like the chief priest, of the city of Yekaterinburg, which is named for St. Catherine, right? And the, this particular event, so he's doing it, he's got a microphone, he's doing a video, a live video feed down to the people of Yekaterinburg, telling them that he received this from the Metropolitan and that he will bring it back when he returns in, I think, September, October, before the Saints' Day. But he's doing this thing on this day because there was a procession happening in Yekaterinburg to commemorate the 104th anniversary of the murder of the Romanov family. And that happened in Yekaterinburg. Like, so this is all like, it, this is like all fitting together. <laughs> right? You can do yeah, a lot very, with one photo. Wow. This yeah. <laughs> very, it's very complicated and dense, but this is what's going on. Right. And so the, the Romanovs have now, you know, received kind of a rehabilitation post communism and especially under Vladimir Putin, uh, the nationalism of the Russian empire, et cetera. And so that's what all of this is playing into in, in addition to the increased prominence of the Russian Orthodox Church, so uh, with, which we see in the cross and the various icons and the relationships between the crew members and the, and the, the clergy. So, so we've actually tracked the display, which this is an unusual and very temporary version of that display, but there are always things on this wall. In fact, I was able to catalog 78 different items 
that appeared over 14 years. And we were able to see that different crews are more religious and some are less religious, but also that the displays go along with moments of national importance. So uh, the celebration of the end of the 60th anniversary of World War II in 2005, the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, or the buildup, because we, we only did up to 2014, but the buildup to mm. the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And we can see the rise in, in religious items, particularly associated with those moments. In addition, actually, we were able to even look back at Mir and the Salyut space station and see that there was a tradition oh, really? going back. Yes, going back decades. In fact, the earliest uh, example we saw of a visual display goes back to Salyut 5 in 1976 of, an, of a portrait of Yuri Gagarin. You know, so he's like this, this secular saint, a hero, maybe who's protecting the crew or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, some, some, somebody they can look up to and build an identity around. So, so that's happened frequently. And, not, and the architecture of those space stations is what the Zvezda modules architecture is derived from. Like, it's, it's, this, there's a cultural tradition that's happened and that's been developed among cosmonauts that this is an appropriate place to do this, even though there are no actual accommodations like hooks or fasteners or anything like that in this area. It's just some empty space <laughs> That's also visually prominent that they were opportunistic about, right? They like so the light their YouTube wall, <laughs> wallpaper is what totally. it is there, right? <laughs> or or your refrigerator door, I would say. Like I think yeah. that that's, a, that's kind of an apt, right? Like what do you totally. what do you put up the things that you care about or things that, that you 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 as a family bond over, right? So that's I think that that's a little bit of the phenomenon there. Hmm. That's fascinating. I mean, this is like I feel like this five minute segment was exactly like why your project is so awesome and why <laughs> NASA should care about this, because like purely as like an opposition research type situation that you just unpacked for us, like you can figure out all these things about, you know, if it's quite literally Kremlinology to some extent, you know, like you're you're doing what that word was derived from, which was like, whose pictures hanging where and why is why is Korolev not in this? And why is this guy in this? It's it's very interesting how you can draw all that out from, you know, what Jake and I ridiculed because we don't understand the language and don't know what he was talking about. It's just a very ridiculable <laughs> image, you know? Right. So, I, I so just, before we go any further, I do just I do just want to say we're not in opposition to anything as researchers. Oh, I didn't mean you. I meant like NASA you know, should care I, about it from like just keeping tabs on everyone. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I just wanted to clarify that, you know, for for the public audience that's watching this. Um, we did actually look at visual displays in the U.S. orbital segment. There's a there's actually been for some period of time. We don't know how long. It was actually thanks to Roland and uh, Roland Miller's and Paolo Nespoli's photos that we were first able to identify that there's actually a crew memorial that is uh, located on oh, the right, hatch right, of right. Node One that that commemorates deceased. Uh, colleagues, you've got his book there, Orbital, or sorry, yeah. uh, Interior, Interior Space. Space. Yeah, exactly. Such a fantastic book. Such a fantastic book. And we actually at Chapman, we did the premiere exhibition of these photos. I was really pleased to be able to do that. Um, but but so, it was yeah, Node so One. We, Is that where it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see up on the door that there's like a there's different photographs of crew members, including from uh, like the Columbia crew. Um, that 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 died in the, the tragic accident, um, but there's also even like a nameplate from an office door at JSC of one of a of an ass, fellow astronaut who actually never flew, but who clearly the crew felt strongly about and wanted to commemorate him after his death. Uh, so there's there's stuff like that in the U.S. segment, but it's not like is this the yeah uh... exactly and you see it that's exactly it that's exactly it right so you see Frank Caldero's name there. Um, you see uh, uh, a astronaut patch there with a name on it. I can't read it, but you see other other items up there that that commemorate um, different figures. And sometimes that's up there, and sometimes it's not because NASA actually doesn't want the public to see those kinds of displays. So the crew is actually told uh, to sanitize areas of public displays before they take images, which is not what happens mm. on the Russian side at all. So that's a really interesting cultural difference. Something you, know, you were talking about who appears and who doesn't appear. Uh, Alice and I have, and Wendy have noted that Valentina Tereshkova does not appear. The first woman in space does yeah, not that appear tracks. on the Mezda wall. Well, but Alexei Leonov did appear, but only after he died in 2019. So it may be the case that the the Russian crew says you can only be mm. here after you've died. Valentina's still alive, and so maybe she's like in the Duma know, still. Yeah. I think right. 
She is, as yeah, far as I understand. Just and doing, yeah. doing work. <laughs> and, and, you know, when she does pass away, and if ISS is still a going concern at that point, maybe she, her portrait will then be added huh. to that. Huh. That would clarify things for us about what the what the meaning is. But we well, that's a, that. so I mean, there... that's a perfect example of how interesting the difference is, that they will only display deceased people, and we are like, please take that down. We don't want to remember yeah, STS-107 yeah. and the space station. So I, I have a question kind of related to that. So the... It seems like the there's there's two big factors you have we talked about which is like there's you know the ISS is a huge political symbol and so you know the Russians are using it for their own propaganda and the astronauts mm -hmm. taking stuff down for some other you know public outreach communication issue that NASA can, you know perceives so there's like you know there's a lot of extra uh, geopolitical attention on this and then you have the other factor which is space is such a special you know, unique place that I imagine that humans are more likely than normal to put trinkets and symbols and objects in that place to get to give them value, right? Because that's, that's always what you hear, you know, that's like one of the most common question astronauts get, what are you taking to space and then bringing back? And so there's, and they always get like a little stupid box. So it's always just these tiny little things they can bring or whatever, right? So as an archaeologist, like, does that, how do you, process that because it's not just like someone's kitchen it's like a very unique interesting place that probably has very little analogs on earth in terms of um, you know the kind of stuff you would stick on the walls right how do you how do you handle that yeah that's a that's a really important point because this is it is unusual in that they live where they work and they relax where they live and you know they 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 don't have very, they have hardly any control at all. This is actually turning out to be a major focus of our work is the lack of autonomy uh, and agency that astronauts and cosmonauts have over the place where they're spending significant amounts of time. Right, they're spending six months or a year, and ultimately eventually longer in these environments. Right, but they don't get to choose where to work, when to work, how to work. They don't get to choose where to sleep. The births are fixed. They can't like just pull them out of the wall and put them in some other place if they would prefer to be some other place. Um, Unless, until it gets really busy, then they're just sleeping everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> when well, there's a lot of people on board. <laughs> yes, that is exactly there. You know, they just they'll put up a sleeping bag, right? At the moment, there are eight crew births uh, on board. Two of them have been added in the, the last year, one in Nauka module and one in Columbus. Um, and before that, often there was a, a disjunction between the number of people and the number of births that were available. Often there was at least one more person on board than there were births available. And what, what, what does that mean for the experience of that person who's kind of the odd person out, right? They, they, they don't get the same privacy. Even though the pri privacy we're talking about is incredibly limited by the fact that it's the size of a telephone booth and it's made of fabric. You know, it's, it doesn't even have hard walls for the most part, like the, Zez, the two in Zvezda do, but the, the four in in Node Two do not. And like, and they're all they're all connected, like they're basically touching each other. Those people have more privacy, however, than the person or people who don't even get that, right? So <laughs> one one of the things we are interested in is privacy and what uh, what the experience of the crew again is and so you know we've proposed experiments and we can talk about the one that we did later but uh we, one of the other experiments that we proposed was about acoustics now the acoustics of iss ha are pretty well understood from the point of view of what the decibel rating is in each location like what is the volume in each location where is it louder where is it quieter but what nobody knows at the moment is how far away do you have to be from somebody else to have a private conversation? Mm. So like some astronauts in their memoirs, Samantha Cristoforetti, who's up there right now, wrote about this in her memoir. She said, you know, you're basically on the honor system when you're having a video conference back home with your loved ones or your, your, your friends or family and that somebody's not listening in also because they share radio channels. So anybody could just click the, a radio channel on and hear what you're talking about. Right. So that means that you can't be as open and honest as you might otherwise want to be or feel like you even need to be like, it's like that's kind of like being able to confide in somebody else is a, an mm -hmm. important part of of being human. And so what we'd like to do is have a scripted conversation where two crew members are speaking and they've got microphones and there's a third crew member off to the side who's far away and gradually coming closer. And also with a decibel meter, like how close do they have to come and then measure it before they hear? what's being said in the scripted conversation. So that for the first time, 
space station designers will be able to understand that phenomenon as opposed to just saying, oh, it's really loud here, or it's quieter here, right? That, that's a, those are different kinds of questions. And those are social and cultural questions that are the kinds of things that we're well equipped to ask and answer and that you don't see, for example, I don't know, biologists, doctors, mm -hmm. or even necessarily yeah, yeah. psychologists answering. And I feel like it has major impacts for crew makeup as well, especially, you know, long duration missions. You always talk about like, how, do, how does the crew work together and do they like each other? But it's like, are they okay talking about family issues around the other person? And they're, are they okay sharing health details with the other person? Because, yeah, you you would feel stifled by that if you could never talk about any of that. If you're up there for six months, if you're going to Mars for a couple of years, uh, it's really mm -hmm. interesting to now that we're here and we can talk about that kind of stuff because we've figured out enough of the basics of space that, you know, we can we can survive up there. But now how do we actually live uh, is still being yeah, figured yeah. out, um, which actually is brings up in my mind a tweet I sent to Jake last night uh, that you tweeted about. Um, I forget the exact wording of it, but. Uh, there's there's always this saying that goes around that oh, the ISS is 20 years old and we're just now hitting our stride with research and we're just now have all this crew time available because commercial crews online and I don't know if it was you tweeting or somebody else under the ISS archaeology account but uh, you're talking about how like does anyone ask why it took 20 years because most space stations don't last 20 years so like what are we doing <laughs> if, that it took 20 years to get here do you I don't know if you have any more than that rant that you uh, put up on Twitter last night. But I'd be curious to pick your brain on that. Yeah, I think it was actually something I said during the ISS Research and Development Conference because it was something that it was repeatedly said by the, the NASA administrators who were, who were present at the conference. They were so, so proud that now we're talking about a decade where we can just do research. We're, in other words, the first, the first decade was building, the second was kind of learning how to live with it. And now we're in the real research phase they were because they're really trying to encourage also both academic and commercial research on iss in the time that remains with this platform and i i do i do think that you know it's worth thinking about how it took so long there there's no doubt that there are geopolitical reasons there are economic reasons why it took so long uh I mean, iss doesn't really doesn't entirely look like it was planned like even when the first modules were launched in 1998 there were changes like there are some modules that were never launched uh, some modules arrived very late and were attached in places that they weren't supposed to be, et cetera, right? So there are reasons, understandable. But as I said in that tweet, you know, the commercial LEO destinations folks don't have 20 years to get that right, right? They, they, don't, they need to get that right straight out of the gate, and they need to be able to start to make money, honestly, Right, they need to be able to utilize the station the way it's supposed to be. And I know I understand that several of them have said, like, we're a one-launch space station. Right, everything's going up all at once, and we'll be ready to go. Um, but even so, you know, there's going to be there is going to be a learning curve for them. But what uh, what has what lessons have been learned from ISS? That's a really important question. And one of the things that I like to think about our project uh, doing is that you know. NASA and the other space agencies are always so focused on the present and the future that they are rarely looking at the past to understand what they could be doing better. And we see that, for example, in forensic documents or actually documents that we made forensic, like the inventory management system, which is the database that they use just to know what's on board. If you look at this database, like it'll tell you what's on board, but it's very it's almost impossible to search because like the same thing, a five inch by five inch Ziploc bag is written six different ways. So there's no data validation and it. it's very, very hard to actually know what all of those like things are. what was are used and where did it go and yeah. Where is it located on the space station? There's stuff obviously both in Russian and in English in it. Um, and those things are not necessarily translated the same way. Um, what, one of the things that we did with the Australian Research Council grant that we had from 2019 to 2021 was we hired a database engineer to make that into a forensic document that could be queried properly and that has in, built in translation and stuff like that so that we can actually track trends. It's not just a question of what have you got right now. It's a question of like, what, what do we learn about the patterns? And of course, as archaeologists, the past is, is everything to us. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's another way in which we have a different perspective and ask different questions that can be illuminating and, and, and provide novel information that's data derived. Right. Insights that are derived from hard data as opposed to, you know, anecdote 
You know, it's all well and good to listen to the astronauts tell you, but they're as just as fallible and and unreliable as witnesses as any other human. So this is yeah. this is where we try to come in. Yeah, I mean, the astronauts are their own data points when you get down to it, right? Like you can't you can't necessarily treat them just as data sources. They are data, so you'd have to probably take that into account. Huh. I don't know. I guess so. This is making me all grumpy again about the last astronaut corps because I, I had this same. The same um, thought is, you know, with this, this most recent one that was announced and they, they were billing it as very diverse because, and if you looked at it uh, racially or, or gender based, and, and it was, it was pretty diverse, like great work on that. But then you pull up the resumes and like there was whatever, you know, 12 astronauts and like 10 of them were fighter jet pilots that went to test pilot school. Of those 10, nine of them were, were mechanical or electrical engineers. And then the other scientists were either biologists or physicists. And that's like basically all, or doctors. Like that was that was the, the palette, right? And I was like, okay, diversity is a big word. And if you're going to throw it around, you need to kind of mean it in, in all sorts of different ways, right? And yeah, I, so I guess, uh, you know, this feels like something NASA should be addressing like too sweet here. Like if we're going to have these, these commercial companies building space stations right now they're they're on the you know there's there's drawings on the board right now about how to design these things and like having this information feels like it would be very very valuable to them but uh now we're behind right so uh, i don't know if there's a question buried in that other than <laughs> yeah. well so i i absolutely agree with you um there's no doubt that we face challenges in in trying to particularly in trying to gain funding support for what we're trying mm -hmm. to do, um, because that same bias that you're identifying um, is kind of interwoven throughout the agency at the level, for example, if you look at what's called the Human Research Program, basically what they want to do is make sure that that the crew survive, first of all, but also that they have, they have good and healthy lives before and during and, and after their missions. Um, and they lay out, they lay out all these risks that they see for different kinds of missions, including going to Mars. And then they say, we want to try and mitigate those risks through research. But the only research that they fund is biomedical and psych psychological. And they, there is no room. I mean, I've asked them point blank. They're, they're, they say, if you want funding, you have to, you have to put yourself under some larger biomedical proposal. We're just, we're not equipped. And the same is true of what's called the ISS national lab, which basically uh, manages all the non NASA, the external research, on the american part of the space station they, they likewise they're interested in the life sciences physical sciences remote sensing um education to a certain extent those kinds of things and commercialization and we don't fit into any of that even though the kinds of things that we want to do could be really helpful for example we would love this is going to sound kind of kind of weird but it gets actually towards the tweet that you guys put out to promote this <laughs> dirty stuff gross stuff uh, we want to see is trash we want to get actual trash, a sample of ISS trash in, let's say, three days or a week. What gets, what's getting discarded? Would you believe that nobody has ever really studied that? And, and when I say that, I mean... Just throw it that, in the Cygnus. We're getting rid of that. <laughs> well, yeah, so that's part of it. But even so, when we had shuttle up until 2011, that stuff, some of it would get brought back to Kennedy. And so our question was, well, did you like put it in a landfill at like Kennedy Spence Space Center? Can we go dig it? Can we go find it? Because that's we would love to do that. <laughs> yeah, and the archaeologists we, would happily dig amazing. up the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's that's our that's gold. Awesome. No question. And uh, and so whether it's in the ancient past or the, or the present. So um, turns out all of it got sent to the Brevard County Waste Disposal Facility. Um, and so it's in a public landfill and we would never be able to find it. Mm. And it was never studied. It was just considered trash, right? And what can you do with trash? So as you, the Grinch said, one man's trash is another man's potpourri. I believe that's a direct quote from the movie. <laughs> so sign me up. Right. So, uh, but the other thing is since we've had cargo drag dragon 2012 and after, uh, obviously most trash goes back on the other cargo resupply ships, Cygnus, Progress, et cetera, ATV, HDV, et cetera. Uh, and it, it's designed to incinerate in the atmosphere during reentry. Sometimes trash does come back on Dragon. It's often like wedged in to kind of stop stuff from moving around. And that can be like old clothes or old food containers, stuff like that. But the cargo mission contract specifies that the contractors are not allowed to even open the containers that it's in 
They have to destroy it without opening it. So again, nobody really knows what it consists of. And I would suggest to you, like how much food is left at the bottom of, of an average food pouch, right? That's a good question. Because if you're trying, if you're gonna have an unresupplyable mission to Mars, you wanna know how much you need to put on board. And if that waste can somehow be reduced, reused, recycled, diverted into use again, so much the better, right? And that goes for clothes and it goes for all kinds of consumables. And the fact is that we don't really know the scope of it because it hasn't been studied. So I would argue that our interest in trash is 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 absolutely a, a relevant one to doing future space better. I see the question, can you FOIA trash? I don't think so. I don't think so. I haven't gone that route yet. Um, but I'll I'll check it out because you know if that's my if that's my route that's my route. I will say I, I will say I have a meeting at JPL in a couple of weeks with somebody with the microbiology team there who is able at least to get the food samples and we may be collaborating on a pro proposal with them about that. But stay tuned. Hmm. Yeah, they might not show it to you though because of ITAR, right? And so that Australian on your team is going to be a real bummer. I don't. Yeah. That, what so, if somebody so scribbled expert... a rocket nozzle on one of those food containers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that's that's a potential issue, but uh, we won't know until we cross that bridge. So maybe you, um, we could put you in contact with Mike Gold, who might be able to add a line about trash openness to the Artemis Accords. I'm just thinking <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to be up there together. Maybe we should make I a communal asked him trash. Last week. Yeah, you should have. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He was at that thing. Get the, why he's is it trash in the Artemis? Every, he's sports? everywhere, I think. He's literally <laughs> everywhere, true. I think. But <laughs> why maybe, maybe he'll be at IAC in Paris, and I'll talk to him there. <laughs> yeah, you got to get the trash accords going. <laughs> the trash accords. Um, well, you know, hey, look. Let, let, let me let me put this a, a slightly different way. As far as as far as sustainability, something else that we we were interested in was you know they're planning to deorbit ISS right in 2031, which is sad. I mean, because it's such a it's such it's the literally it's the first permanent human habitation site in space. And, um, you know, so, so not to be able to have access to that going forward will really be sad. We are actually thinking about and we've we started to suggest to certain NASA folks who are, who are engaged with these issues about items that maybe could be brought back that would be evocative of the history uh, and be able to tell public stories and or be important for scientists to study, et cetera. But you know, the other thing is that it's a 450 ton space station that they're going to try to put into a relatively small spot of the Pacific Ocean. And there's only been one space station that anybody's tried to do that with before, and that was Mir, right? So Skylab went into Australia. Salyut 7 went into Argentina, right? Uh, Tiangong 1 was not controlled and by sheer chance ended up in the Pacific Ocean. But that was just luck, right? The Mir example, which Mir was a quarter of the size of ISS, didn't work perfectly. It had too long of a burn, and it actually landed 2,000 kilometers short of where it was supposed to. And we don't know what landed in the, what actually survived reentry and landed in the water. This is a little bit like the Long March uh, rocket mm -hmm. body that just came in right a couple of days ago, but mm -hmm. but the, on a much larger, five times larger than that. Right. So we would like to go and look on the ocean floor for the remains of Mir because it's important for NASA to understand as well as they can what is likely to survive from ISS. And the fact is that there are architecturally identical parts like the Zvezda module between the two space stations. So that's one aspect. But again, to come back to the sustainability issue, how sustainable is it for us to keep throwing space stations and other space stuff into the ocean? This stuff is often toxic. We don't have a good understanding of exactly what survives because of where the remoteness of where we're sending it. We do know about things like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Is that, <laughs> uh, should, should we be concerned? I'm, I'm serious about this because we've got four more space stations that are being built by US organizations that are not planning for this necessarily. Don't really, I mean, their plan presumably is also to deorbit. We've got the Russians talking about a space station. The Chinese have their own space station right now. Where is all of this two. going to go? They got two up there. Oh no, so, the one came. Did the one Tiangong two come down yet? Tiangong one came down. One, There's but a, two still up there, right? 
There's a yeah, two is still up there, and it now has two modules. No, that's yeah, three. Yeah. So there's what's... another one. There's a there's a there was a sequel uh, before the triple. The, there was Tiong Gong two. It was a little test so, one. They did it a little, just a little test. So where is this stuff all going, and how how much longer can we continue to do this? Should we, as a matter of environmental ethics, be taking this into account? I mean, the ocean's big, but yeah. it's inhabited too, not by us, but it's inhabited. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a uh, a gentleman who has a shitload of money that once pulled up some rocket engines for the bottom of the ocean from a very historic space mission that I feel like might be interested if you told him that he could have a piece of mirror hanging in his headquarters somewhere. So, <laughs> well, it, it, okay. it would and, still belong, and to, the, it still belong to the Russians. Uh, that's a good point. It, it would still yeah. belong to the Russians. And not only that, but we have no interest in t- picking it up. We would leave it where it is because, in fact, actually best practices in, in heritage management are to leave things in situ if they face no other threat. And so that's and specifically that's part of actually the UNESCO Underwater Cultural Heritage Convention. So we would. So you're saying we should send Richard that. Garriott down to Mir? <laughs> well, I mean, or, he would go. Or he actually, would go in a, in a heartbeat. <laughs> actually, we've been talking about underwater autonomous vehicles. There's a company in Austin called Teradep that we've been talking about with this. Uh, and so you know, but but we would want to we would want to map that. I mean, it's like what is the debris trail? If you look at the Columbia report. That stuff was spread over hundreds of miles, and those mm-hmm. were approximately yeah. the same size, Columbia and Mir. So, you know, what what is the actual threat? That's the only That's the Columbia accident is the only example where we have actually identified eighty thousand individual pieces of a spacecraft that that deorbited. So, wow. you know, there's mm-hmm. there's lessons to be learned here, and I think we should. Yeah. We have. Um verifiable proof that there is at least one individual from every company that is bidding on commercial leo uh, listening to this podcast right now and so you have a direct line into at least somewhere in the hierarchy of these companies and i'm curious <laughs> if you're able to tell them like you need to talk to us about this particular thing to better inform your space station design is it living quarters is it work sites like what is the what are the things that you're finding on iss or maybe it's things that you found from the past past stations to ISS that have been improved? Like where are the areas of improvement that they should focus on from your work? Right, so in fact, actually, we've already been talking to these folks. I mean, I don't know about the individuals who are actually- Might be the same ones. Here today, could be. Um, we've been talking to these folks and, and that's exactly the message that we're trying to get across is that there are, there's not only things that we are interested in that should interest them, whether it's things like the visual displays, or I, I mentioned very briefly, we, we actually were able to use the photographic data from ISS for the first time to, um, to actually show what the distribution of populations across all of the modules of ISS are by, by gender, by nationality, by space agency. And the results are a little bit surprising. Um, so for example, um, you know, we were able to show that women do not appear very frequently in the Russian module. Maybe that's not so surprising because they've only sent one, one yeah. female cosmonaut Wikipedia so far. had me on that one. <laughs> yeah. But, but women, women also do not appear in the photographs very frequently in the eating or hygiene exercise areas. And yet they appear 50% more often than their numbers would suggest in the cupola. So that's kind of interesting. Why is that the case? Uh, with nationality, it's what the we hair. See is, Zero G hairs is hard to pass up. Go. It's very photogenic. <laughs> it if, they happen to, if they happen to have long hair, yeah. yes, exactly. But, yeah. but for na- for nationality, for example, we've been able to show that there really are nationalized areas of this, of what purports to be an international space station. So the number two group in the Japanese module is the Japanese. The number two group in the European module is the Italians. The U.S. is number one in both of those, but that's because their numbers are so much larger than every yeah. other group in yeah. the U.S. Or the others segment, don't right? have a, a crew member on every flight. It's like one or two a year at our current rate, at which most. is higher at than it was in the past. Yeah. Where do all the at Canadians most. hang out? <laughs> By the arm controller. <laughs> no, <laughs> all no, photograph driving true. Canada arm. <laughs> the Canadians are, are more or less evenly distributed around the U.S., primarily in the U.S. segment again. But then the Russians really dominate in the Russian segment. Right? So, so for as much as this has been talked about as an international project, what we really see is the effect of the, the governance systems, the management systems of ISS, which, I, again, like 
This is not necessarily a huge surprise, but it, what it points to is important. So each agency kind of controls its own facilities and decides what's going to go on there and who's going to be working in those areas. And so that's not, I mean, this is a project that cost $150 billion or more, the most expensive building project in the history of humanity, perhaps. And it's not being run in a way that everybody is using it equally according to their proportion of the population. In other words, there are real inefficiencies there. And so it, it will be to the detriment of these others, these, these private space station operators, if they don't figure out a way to make that better, to make it as efficient as it possibly can be so that everybody is available and, and, and has the opportunity to work wherever, right? That's really gonna be a key issue. And it's going to, and what it means is, and also for future international projects like Gateway, right? Is the same thing going to happen on Lunar Gateway? Is the same thing going to happen on a at a Chinese Russian lunar habitat? That's not efficient. What, how are you going to get the most out of the resources that you're expending? And that's that's the sort of thing that I would suggest we can provide insights about. We're also interested, for example, in what are called restraints. Uh, that is to say, attachment points. So like. Um, handrails, bungee cords, Velcro, Ziploc bags, all this stuff. Alice has this great phrase, she calls them gravity surrogates. Because in fact, that's what they are. You know, they're, they're, we're not adapted as, as, a, as a species to anything other than 1G. We're not used to anything other than 1G. So when we put something down, we assume it's gonna stay there. That obviously doesn't work in space. So what do we do? We, have, we use these affordances like Velcro to make that happen. And if you look around the space station, there are areas where Velcro has, has, and you can see this particular, so this is a great image. I'm glad you put this up. So we have this workstation in node two, and you can see that blue panel that has 40 pieces of symmetrically arranged uh, pieces of Velcro to be used to, to stick there, right? So that was planned from the beginning. That was, that was done on the ground. And it was sent up that way. But if you can look just below that, the white area down below, there's other Velcro that was not attached in the same way, <laughs> not symmetrically, not at the same time. It's obviously, this is what archaeologists do, by the way. We notice, for example, that you've got square pieces and then you've got pieces that have the, that are square with the corners cut off. Oh, yeah. And then you have the two rectangular pieces. Like those were not put there at the same time and they're not arranged in the same way. Right, and sometimes whoever put the two rectangles actually, up didn't even care to line up the where they started, which just really drives me nuts. Absolutely, absolutely, but they just they just needed gravity in that location. If you go up a little, I want above, names on this, Justin. I want to know who did this. If this was Victor Glover, my my just world will be shattered. Uh, that he is not. You go as, up to the top. Oh, up to the top. Okay. <laughs> Um, actually, no, it looks like this, they're in this picture, there's there's huggies? Some Ziploc bags they got there. baby wipes up on this space station. They have baby, baby wipes everywhere. That's what they use everywhere. Well, I can pack with That's great. Unfortunately, oh, because of the stuff that's actually stuck to the wall up here, you can't see it. But what I can tell you is from our observation of these images, there are spots where there is residue from removed Velcro the glue from the backing of the Velcro that's there. So we can actually see traces of where there were patches of Velcro and then they were later removed. So that's changes in the gravity, the quote unquote gravity of this location. So they, it builds up in areas where you need it, where you suddenly decide, no, I have to put something here. I can't work otherwise, right? And then sometimes it'll get removed because it's like, no, we're not using that anymore. Okay. so. If you are a future space station operator, how do you understand that going forward in order to mitigate those issues before they become issues? How do you provide the accommodation, the affordance beforehand? Because that's much more efficient and cost effective than jury rigging some kind of solution afterwards, like we'll just stick some Velcro wherever, right? So those are the kinds of things that we're currently studying. How, did the, how does that accrete? Where does it accrete? What activities is that associated with? so that we can actually provide that exact kind of advice to these future operators. And I just, I do want to point out, like this is an unusual archeology span project, no doubt, because it's happening on a site that's still, you know, still being occupied. It's in the present, it's floating in space. Obviously that's unusual as well. But <laughs> another way in which what we're doing is unusual is that we are one of the very few instances of an archeological project that has the opportunity to provide real insights that can help improve life in the future. And that's something that I find really exciting and gratifying about this project. Because <laughs> it, it's so rare that we get to do that. And yet here's a prime example of where you know, the social sciences can contribute. And I often say, 
you know, that that for every, this is our pinned tweet on our project, for every technical problem, every engineering problem, every scientific medical problem, whatever it is that people are trying to solve for space, there are social and cultural components to those problems as well. And if you don't, yep, there it is. And if you don't account for those problems, you're not going to get good results. Right. And, and this is we can see this, for example, on Earth, when we look at different healthcare outcomes for different socioeconomic groups. This is like basic stuff that we should recognize already. And it's why research like ours really should be funded. It, it can make a big difference. It's not just like a luxury, like, oh, we, we figured out how to make people survive. And so now we can do. No, no, you need this. It's going to be important. It's going to save you money. <laughs> yep. Jake, my so new by goal the, by in way, life. We're cheap. <laughs> We're cheap. I was like going to say kind of research compared to compared to other kinds of research in space is incredibly cheap. I I just feel like 2030, like you know, before they turn the lights out, we got to They got to just send Justin, Alice, whoever else they want to send up there. Like go up and there, us, spend we'll, a month. We'll, we'll oh, we'll go. It. We'll yeah, we'll it. totally. We can hold a camera. I got I got lenses. I got good stuff. <laughs> uh, Roland told us they have all of the lenses up on ISS, so that if they keep them there, we'll be good. But like. Go up, spend a month, document the hell out of that place before we sink it. Or, you know, maybe at that, I mean, at that point, I'm hoping we've got some capability to do a better reboost than Cygnus can do. And I don't know, I feel like it would be awesome if this was up there in the future as like, you could go. It needs to be an orbital museum is what it needs to be. It belongs in a museum. A little little ahead of its time, probably. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe not. 2030 is far away. 100%. Yeah. But like, like great questions for the, for the heritage aspect are like, what does it smell like? What did it smell like? Like I think in the future, right? Like how can we preserve those aspects of the experience? We know it smells terrible, by the way. I've, yeah. I've been there when they've opened a cargo transfer bag and it's gross. <laughs> it's like, a, it's absolutely middle school locker room plus like doctor's <laughs> office. Well, nasty, but, <laughs> but I shouldn't be the only one to have that experience. <laughs> you don't want to be the only one to smell in the ISS. No. no, but seriously, I mean, that's like future space stations, hopefully will solve those problems and it'll smell, you know, more like what we what we're used to on Earth. But it's imp- like that's an important stage in our development as a species moving off the Earth. People should be able to know what it, what it meant to live in in places like this. Mm-hmm. All right. Man, this has been that's... amazing. This is awesome. Yeah, that's great. We got to have a part two because I'm like, in, well, there's so many more things we didn't even get to. So we have to have you back on to talk more about it. But... Love, love to do it anytime. Um, if people aren't following along, what would you send them to? Would you send them to Twitter, website, anything else in particular you would uh, point them to? Yeah, absolutely. Our website is issarchaeology.org. And so you can check out our blog posts there. You can check out all the news reports that we've been featured in various news reports as well. So please check that out. And uh, our Twitter feed is where we're most active, at ISS Archaeology. And I'm at J-S-T-P-W-A-L-S-H, J-S-T-P Walsh. So feel free to follow us there. We're, th- we're seven followers away from 3,000. Get us there. Come on. Oh, Do it. Got it. Off nominal yeah, listeners. Yeah, we got to get Do it anomalies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jake, what you got? Ah, what do I got? Well, I'm just getting back up to speed. Um, but uh, I recently just put out an episode with um, uh, of We Martians with uh, Abby Freeman, who's the deputy project scientist for Curiosity, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary tomorrow. So it's a big day for Curiosity. We talked about where the mission came from, and uh, you know some of her favorite moments and what's coming up. So that was a really fun episode. Uh, I love Abby; she's great. Uh, and next week, uh, I have a very special guest on the show. Uh, you might know him. It's you, Anthony. It's, it's me. You're on the show. And you make a you make a dig joke, a, a digging in the dirt joke mm-hmm. about me, which I, I both uh, thought was very true and also didn't appreciate. So uh, we will <laughs> we'll get, <laughs> we'll get into that. Uh, and we're going to talk about clips, uh, commercial lunar payload services, and some of the uh, funky stuff going on with that. Um, yeah, funky. we should also talk, uh, Anthony, about uh, Artemis One. Um, so just before we head out, here, listeners. We're going to see this rocket launch. So this will be the first uh, post-pandemic meetup. So we don't have any of the details yet, but if you do want to you know, be <laughs> notified as like what's happening and where you should go, if you're going to be in the Florida area around the whatever this rocket launch is, Highly uh, variable. go to the site. Yeah, yeah. go to the site, uh, offnom.com slash events. You'll see this Artemis One launch events link and you can put your email in there and that way you'll get the emails for like, Here's the venue. Here's the time. All that kind of stuff. So uh, feel free to sign up there if you're going to be around the uh, Port Canaveral, yeah. Cape Canaveral area, 
uh, for that launch. So. And if you end up in Florida around the launch and you are on this email list, check your email a lot because we're we're likely to just send out yeah. an email like we're going to this place. We change Please the venue hang out. and then yeah. yeah, and then we we move it and then we cancel it. We change the time. That's us. This is yeah. phenomenal. Well, guys. it's also it's not going to go. It's smoothly. also 2022 <laughs> and like. My wife was supposed to fly today, and she just got a text at like two. Your flight's canceled. Have fun rebooking. Like I'm not rebooking you on uh, by myself. You got to figure this one out. So like, there's <laughs> yeah. gonna be highly variable. The the rockets are gonna move. The planes aren't gonna work. I have to go to a wedding basically at the same time as the launch. Like it's gonna be an extremely variable situation. But uh, yeah, we're gonna see what happens. I guess you won't. I guess you won't have time to go to the landfill and look for ISS trash then. I might dig around. Well, I can't promise you. Hey, I won't. I, I don't recommend it. I honestly, I shouldn't, I shouldn't joke about that. I don't recommend it. But like, why are you here, to, sir? Say something. <laughs> Justin sent me I'm wearing a shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bob Cabana is going to be very mad at all these listeners that are out there digging in. <laughs> in his well, trash. He's, he's in Washington now. He's in Washington now. That's and true. Actually, oh, yeah. He's, not... he's, he's the reason we found out about where the trash was, actually. He was very helpful oh, with that. Good, good wow. for him. Hey, thank you. Hot tip from, <laughs> thank from you, Bob. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, folks, uh, that's it. That's all we got. Okay. We're out of here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> See ya. Thanks. Thanks. It was great.